These are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center. I'd like to welcome you on our monthly MPA webinar series. And today we're going to be hearing about the Global Ocean Refuge System uh, from the Marine Conservation Institute. And I will introduce our speaker in a minute. First, I wanted to note that we have put together uh, the MPA monthly webinar series for the next several months. So I hope that you'll go to our website and check it out. Our website is marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov, and you'll see the webinar series posted there. And I want to thank EBM Tools and Open Channels, our partners in this webinar series. Uh, and all of our past webinars are also archived on Open Channels and on our website at uh, MPA, uh, the NOAA website. Uh, so I also wanted to uh, pass the mic over to Nick Weiner from Open Unmuted to talk about the new MPA list. Go ahead, Nick. Hi, everyone. Um, so the MPA News and Open Channels team decided that it was high time for a new MPA discussion listserv again. So we just launched it, or launched MPA list with the University of Washington. Uh, if you head over to openchannels.org slash MPA list, uh, you can sign up there. There's just a simple form at the bottom of the website. Uh, anything you want to know about MPAs, you know, it's an informal discussion list. Just go ahead and talk about anything you want on there. Thanks. Okay, great. I'm sure that's going to be of a lot of interest. All right, so um, I will introduce our speaker in just a moment. I just wanted to mention that we are going to be uh, having uh, plenty of time for questions at the end of this talk. So I encourage you to type your questions into the question box, and we'll be taking those at the end. So please go ahead and do that. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lance Morgan. Uh, Lance is a marine biologist who became enchanted with the kelp forests of California after getting his scuba certificate as a teenager, and he has since explored the ocean as a scuba diver, aquanaut, and submersible pilot. And he came to the Marine Conservation Institute as a postdoctoral fellow in 2000 and became president in 2012. He has worked on marine protected area issues over the past decade, including the Cordell Bank Sanctuary Advisory Council and participating in the Marine Life Protection Act Initiative in California, uh, which, as many of you know, designed the first statewide system of MPAs in the U.S. Uh, he has also um, authored reports on the impact of fishing methods on marine life and papers on MPAs, and is currently the chairman of the board for the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition and holds a research faculty appointment at the Bodega Marine Lab. So I will turn it over to you, Lance. Thanks and welcome. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Lauren, and good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to address you all and tell you a little bit more about the Global Ocean Refuge System. This is an initiative that we've been working on at the Marine Conservation Institute. Elliot Norris, uh, the staff, the boards, some key advisors over the past year, have, we've all been discussing uh, how do we really advance uh, marine protected areas globally, not, um, not following the kind of the one-off pathway that we know is, uh, works in certain cases but hasn't really been up to the uh, task of really implementing uh, the 10% targets and really uh, aligning with the 20% or greater numbers that a lot of marine biologists think we need in order to really protect marine life. We're also very much interested in the question of quality as well as quantity. So these are some of the things that we've uh, started to incorporate in our thinking about the Global Ocean Refuge System and what I'd like to talk to you further about today. Oops, what happened there? Okay, technical glitch there. So, um, we do work to save wild ocean places for about the last decade. The Marine Conservation Institute has been uh, very much focused on marine protected areas, trying to help not only their designation, but trying to identify the important areas around the world, um, both within the U.S. and more internationally and on the high seas. Those areas that are um, warranting protection, also taking on the task of not only trying to help with the designations, but then follow up the designations with effective management and what does effective management mean and, and some of those questions. So our staff has worked across uh, these three issues uh, for a, a predominant focus of our organization's effort over the last, and increasingly so over the last 
uh, several years, and as we move forward, we're looking to expand this work through the Global Ocean Refuge System. And the real reason, of course, that we're interested in this is the protecting is for the protection and recovery of the diversity and abundance of marine life. Um, we all know that there, there are an onslaught of problems facing oceans today. Um, I'll go through some of these briefly, but I think we're all pretty aware of that. And yet, um, the pace and scale of conservation really is not matching uh, the problems in the ocean. You don't have to look much further than the food and agricultural organizations own numbers about uh, the fate of what fisheries look like right now. Uh, something on the order of 85% of the populations for which we have information are either overfished or fully exploited. Um, if you look at just those stocks on the high seas, 60% um, of those are in this overfished, depleted, or recovering category. So it's clear we really don't have much room, much space, um, any populations out there where we can continue to um, meet the challenges of a global population in terms of uh, seafood, um, let alone the idea that we aren't going to get there without a different strategy in terms of management. And so um, we really need to start thinking about this differently. And, and as you know, we're not even counting things like IUU fishing often in those reports. Um, we're also not necessarily talking about the smaller scale fisheries around the world, like artisanal fisheries and coastal fisheries um, that aren't commercial. So the situation is probably um, worse than the numbers indicate, and we're really looking at um, a pathway that has been established for something over a thousand years. Callum Roberts, a very interesting book, it's a great read, and I highly recommend it, but he's tracked about the last thousand years of, of humans' interactions with, with fish and, and fisheries. Um, and, and it's clear from looking at that that we've basically just progressed from overfishing um, freshwater sources of, of uh, fish to coastal areas and even now to the high seas. So this, this theme of having nowhere else to go um, is really well articulated in Callum's book and the, the fact that we really need to start looking for solutions. Other pieces of this story that you might all be aware of include um, the impacts of losing top predators in the ecosystem. So Ram Myers and some of his colleagues um, were able to show that as we lose, uh, as we overfish the apex predators, in this case the hammerheads in the southeast of the United States, um, we release the countos rays from predation pressure, and as a result of their population explosion, they have been fed heavily on the scallops. This may have not been much of an issue, except for the fact that the scallops are a very prized um, fishery resource in their own. So it's not just always about uh, the biodiversity of the systems, it's also about you know maintaining a healthy ecosystem for um, fishermen as well as for fish. And as Jeremy Jackson and many his, of his co-authors, the many co-authors of this paper from 2001, have pointed out that this overfishing and this is historical overfishing has been one of the, the past greatest causes of ecosystem collapse around the world. So the, the state of the oceans just from our own exploitation of marine life is, is pretty overwhelming. And then we add to that a future that is with elevated carbon dioxide, which makes um, prospects potentially even more daunting. Um, not just the warming and, and the coral bleaching and some of the problems that we see already, but the acidification and what that might do to trophic food webs by um, affecting you know the prey base as well as you know coral reefs and other things is really a, a fairly significant and, and looming threat and and there's some really dire expectations about what will happen to coral reefs but I think there's also um, some pretty uh, significant impacts that will, will happen throughout marine food chains and food webs that are going to affect fisheries as well as as marine life and biodiversity
We know that these um, changes are going to affect people fairly dramatically. This uh, global map shows um, in the dark kind of red colors those countries that are going to be most significantly um, impacted by climate-induced changes to fisheries. Um, what you may not be able to read down below is that 19 of the 33 countries that are most highly vulnerable are least developed countries. So we're going to continue to have, um, you know, potentially very looming threats, especially to the ability of people to feed themselves in certain countries of the world as this continues. As it So what can be done to help recover ecosystems and provide some level of resilience in the future? Well, I think a lot of us agree that marine protected areas are key to this. And of course, they're key because certain important things only occur in certain places. And we're becoming more and more aware of this through a variety of, of important tools and, and new technologies. But it's also that protecting places doesn't require all of the high data demands of single species management. Um, a few of the wealthier countries of the world can really afford to, to manage fisheries at that level, but a lot of countries aren't going to have that expertise and that capacity to do that type of management. And so we have marine protected areas as a, as a much more cost-effective tool uh, at our disposal, which we know is going to have added benefits on top of traditional management as well. We also know that um, while we traditionally think of protected areas as only working for sedentary, less mobile species, that there are a variety of pelagic species that do concentrate in predictable places where food is abundant or for other reasons, and that we're increasingly aware of these habitats um, and where they are. Um, it, it shouldn't come as that big of a surprise. I know fishermen have known for years where to go fishing in the pelagic environment to catch fish. And so this information is out there and can be incorporated into different marine protected area discussions and designations. Likewise, uh, these same tools have given us a much greater appreciation for uh, migration routes. In this case, we have uh, humpback whale populations around the globe. We have a much better understanding both about where they um, have their feeding grounds and where they have their calving grounds around the world and the population connectivity in many different places. We know that, again, fishes and corals concentrate on offshore sea mounts and banks. In this case, this is a photo from, from Cordell Bank here off of Northern California. And it's often recognized that we can protect these kinds of habitats quite well. But I think what is often not so well identified is the fact that these same offshore banks are destinations for a whole variety of, of different species in the ecosystem. And that, at least here at Cordell Bank, it's, it's well known that we see leatherback sea turtles, shearwaters, albatrosses and fulmars, blue whales, humpback whales, all come to Cordell Bay as a feeding area. And so despite the fact that, that there seems to be a lot of um, concern about what you do with mobile species, we do know that there are these key places in the ocean that are worth protecting. Again, this doesn't really come as a surprise to others. We've known on land that reserves are a powerful conservation tool. We have over 100 years of, of history of this in the United States. Um, this is Yosemite Valley, again, another Northern California example. Um, but we really are much further behind the scenes in the ocean. Um, probably the, the first underwater protected area was about 1960. Um, we had some you know, seabird reserves and, and land-based marine areas protected before that. But the first real underwater park um, was probably in Florida in the 1960s, at least as, as far as I really know. So we have a much shorter time scale for uh, underwater reserves. But at the same time, we're seeing a, a nice um, accelerating trend in the past decade as well. And with this trend in designation of areas and improving science, we've started to see that there is now increasing evidence that there are um, indeed significant ecological benefits of these full no-take reserves. 
Um, there are also benefits of other different uh, MPAs that have varying protection levels, but the relationship of, of what you see an MPA protection level um, varies quite a bit, and, and there's really, I think, I mean, a much stronger sense that no-take areas really do show the benefits that we'd all like to see much more clearly. Um, and so we need to start having, I think, a more uh, robust conversation around what is the quality of, of protection. The recent paper by Graham Edgar and his co-authors, again, showed that you know, large fish diversity and abundance are much higher in MPAs that have been strongly protected for longer periods of time, are large enough, and are isolated. These are um, some new, really interesting findings, but really go to the point of, of talking about what are the expectations of protected areas with different types of rules and regulations. Um, another important finding that both from Edgar and other marine reserves is that sharks tend to be a very good indicator of how healthy um, your ecosystem is. If you can find these top predators there, um, you can be um, much more confident the reserve is, is performing well. So going back to the progress we've made to date, um, this is a map of the Central Pacific um, around Hawaii and, and some of the U.S. territories south of Hawaii. And the yellow areas are now uh, U.S. Marine National Monuments, or very strongly protected um, areas. The Marine Conservation Institute helped advocate for the protection of these areas, as well as uh, some follow-on work to, to ensure their um, management and, and programs were in place and, and regulations were issued. But the real reason I show these is that prior to 2006, when Papa Hanamukuakea was first established, the conventional wisdom was that you could have either small areas strongly protected or large areas weakly protected. Um, and I think this basically broke that model, or at least gave us the idea that we could certainly have big areas that are strongly protected. And all of these light green, yellow areas together now cover an area of ocean about the size of California and Washington states put together. They're, um, enormous areas, and they're all strongly protected um, areas, and they have good management schemes that are built in place to help them um, track moving forward. And this has um, been a continuation of some large areas like the Great Barrier Reef that were originally protected um, back in the 70s, but an escalating um, pathway to more large protected areas um, that we've seen over the last few years, including the world's largest um, protected area, Chagos, or, or fully no-take protected area, the Chagos Marine Protected Area. This graph also shows one of the things that uh, I brought up earlier, which is the question of quality. Is it um, protected at a level that we um, think will bring us the benefits? And I think we're all aware of some of the problems the Great Barrier Reef is demonstrating uh, right now with, with how effective its protections are. Um, so the green show the areas that have been set aside as, as almost no take or no take. Um, and then the other areas show to what extent the green pie gives you uh, the no take area. Some of these areas, um, like the Phoenix Islands, are very much uh, a work in progress. And I think that's one of the things we need to remind ourselves is that all of these areas represent opportunities to um, improve over time from where they are or, or an expectation that some of the regulations become stronger over time, um, as well as just their status quo at present. And it's not always about being a really big area. Those areas I just showed are the ones that um, are fairly clear on a global scale map. Um, but we have good evidence that um, strongly protected and, and well-managed areas that are much smaller can have very dramatic improvements. Um, Cabo Pomo National Marine Park, which is off the tip of Baja California, is one of those examples. But there are many others um, in the state of California with its recent um, designations is another place where we're seeing the benefits of, of strong protection and good management uh, in place. So that was the good news. Um, the, the less good news is that despite a recent uptick, um, we're still at 
something on the order of 3% of MPA coverage in areas that are broadly defined as marine protected areas. And if we look at the areas that we think are uh, fairly strongly protected or almost no take, um, we're down around 1%. And if you just extrapolate out those lines over the last, since about 2000, you can see that getting to the 10% goal of, of the Aichi targets under the Convention on Biological Diversity are projected fairly well, fair, fairly far out into the future. Um, and to get to something like 20%, which is a more ecologically robust uh, definition, is uh, clearly something over 100 years given the current rates at which uh, MPAs are designated. So in thinking about all of this, in knowing that there are very strong, the science is very strong and getting stronger about the need for protection and the results of, of effective marine reserve protection, how do we envision advancing or accelerating the designation of areas and not just improving the, the quantity of areas that are covered, but also the quality? So we've been talking and, and strategizing around a new effort, the Global Ocean Refuge System, which will be a comprehensive effort to combine what we know about the science of marine protected areas and developing incentives that can change the game so that marine protected areas aren't necessarily a one-off um, opportunity that has a lot of costs associated with it in multi-year timelines, but can actually achieve some sort of accelerating um, trend so that we get to these numbers much sooner. And the idea is to combine both the marine science with, you know, psychology and other opportunities to really bring uh, economic and social science as well together so that we can have a more robust um, understanding of the value of, of ocean protection. So I'm sure you all would agree with me that oceans are in peril and we need to accelerate this protection. Um, we need uh, MPAs to help recover and maintain the biological diversity and abundance. And we believe we really need these well-located areas that have uh, strong protection and management in order for the recovery to occur. One of the analogies that we've been um, thinking about is the idea behind the Global Seed Vault, where they've preserved a bunch of different uh, valuable food crops in this vault in the, the high Arctic of Norway, with the idea that it will be there as a, you know, a safety valve, a safety net, for should we ever have anything catastrophic happen. Well, if you think about that from the ocean perspective, obviously you're not going to uh, bring a bunch of marine life into a little aquarium and keep them alive. But something like the Global Ocean Refuge System, if it's strategic and comprehensive and covers lots of different areas of the world, could be this underwater uh, sea vault. So what are we proposing the Global Ocean Refuge System would do? Well, first, we think it's really important that we have clear standards for marine protected areas that we know what we're talking about from the standpoint of quality of the area when we're discuss having this conversation. Second, we think that the global ocean refuge status can be used as an incentive to encourage countries to uh, work towards uh, marine protected areas, that the status will confer the prestige um, that something uh, of, a, of a high value effort, a green or blue marketing effort to the countries, and a lot of countries we know are very interested in this um, from their behavior already around the travel and tourism and status in terms of different um, efforts that they're engaged in and trying to promote their countries internationally. We also think that Having clear standards for MPAs will help investments from businesses, governments, and, and other philanthropic organizations. Part of this thinking comes from um, things like lead building, 
standards in which you can imagine that uh, if we had a, uh, a bottom tier that would say you've, you've made a, a certain quality of marine protected area that qualifies you for global ocean refuge status, but we can also tier that so that we can encourage people to go towards, encourage governments as well as people to go towards higher levels of protection um, as they um, move into the pathway and then, you know, over time improve um, those areas. It doesn't mean that all the areas have to be no-take um, areas, but it would establish a clear pathway to get to potentially something that like that that would be a no exploitation of this area as the highest standard, but other standards that could be um, below that, that gold or, or platinum level. And we know from, you know, just our experience with, with the Olympics that countries um, take a lot of pride in having, you know, gold medals and silver medals and bronze medals. And so some sort of developing the structure around what the criteria are for each of those levels and then using those to help promote marine protected areas and letting the countries use those to promote their own efforts um, is part of the incentives, as I said, in addition to the ability to encourage travel and tourism. And we see some examples already of countries that really promote themselves based on the opportunities for uh, diving and economic uh, returns of uh, ecotourism. So turning a little bit more towards the criteria, the criteria obviously are where um, the real hard work is in terms of making sure that these areas will be robust and improve the situation. So we are engaged right now in, in some of the preliminary research of trying to define what the appropriate criteria would be and working with other scientists and um, both social and, and natural scientists to look at these. Um, ecological importance is obviously a key factor. Um, level of protection and what kinds of activities are allowed is going to be another important aspect of this. And of course, having the adequate enforcement and management will be a really a key piece of this. Uh, I think a lot of you might know what we mean by ecologically important, but for those that are a little bit unclear, we're, we're talking about both the unique ecosystems as well as systems that have high species richness, our essential breeding, feeding, nursery habitats, migration routes. Um, but we're also thinking about things that have these connectivity benefits, metapopulation benefits of being able to not only, you know, maintain the, prop, the populations of marine life inside the reserve, but also have that added benefit of, of exporting larvae or uh, maintaining connectivity to areas should they be uh, impacted outside the area or, or suffer some sort of catastrophic event, um, the reserves can serve as that that refuge that can then repopulate those areas. We also need to make sure that we're not just putting off 10 big areas somewhere um, far from everywhere and then calling it good. Um, we need biogeographic representation of all the different ecosystem types. This includes, this one is a pelagic uh, biogeography, but we also know there's coastal biogeographies as well as deep sea uh, biogeographies that need to be incorporated in it. Um, we probably also need to think a little bit more carefully about things like the water column, um, which, is, which is its own um, very uh, important ecosystem with very abundant um, fish populations that live in this kind of twilight zone. So we're working to harmonize um, some sort of global biogeographic system and, and we'll you know, need to rely a lot on, on different scientists as well as our staff scientists to help with that activity. Uh, we're all aware of, of paper parks, MPAs that don't offer strong protection, whether it's um, from that it offers only protection from one activity at a time or those that even allow some very damaging activities such as bottom trawling. And so these are the kinds of things that we're already uh, looking at in terms of our MPA Atlas project where there are different 
levels of protection around the world, but really trying to tighten up what it is um, we call different types of MPAs. So the Global Ocean um, Refuge System, we have a website up where you can find a little bit more information out if you want to go there. Um, GlobalOceanRefuge.org, I encourage that strongly. Um, look for um, all of you to provide feedback on the ideas you hear today, what kinds of um, synergies that there might be with your group, um, what kinds of things we think you, you think we should be aware of, as well as what types of opportunities are out there. Um, but this really is meant to be a, a comprehensive strategy that will help all protected area efforts in the ocean. Um, we're not looking to discourage anyone from moving forward with their own efforts, nor um, and strongly encouraging those that already have protected area um, management as part of their effort to think about how they could um, engage and potentially use these criteria to strengthen their area. Um, we're using the science to help think about this from a global perspective, but we recognize that all of these are going to be um, areas that start in specific places. Um, we also recognize that we do need to improve um, both the NGOs working together with the scientists, with each other, and with the managers of all these areas to make this happen. And we're also hoping that Building a more robust understanding of what a marine protected area is will help encourage governments um, to compete for the funding. And then as they recognize that they can get prestige from being a, uh, a global ocean refuge that, that has this high level of protection and is doing things the right way, that that will encourage them and uh, encourage competition amongst governments as well. And so one of the ideas is to use this down the road to help us assess which countries are actually doing uh, a good job at meeting their, not only their commitments, but also the need that we have to uh, protect marine life, not just for marine life's sake, but for the, the economic benefits it returns to their own country um, and citizens. So I love this quote by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Like, you ought to um, not only use that in your own work, but help us to move our work forward. Um, I think it, it's really important that we recognize a lot of these things are going to come down to individuals and groups of individuals really moving um, forward in their own conservation activities. And we're hoping that this Glories will provide an umbrella that will help meet that um, effort as a, from the top. So again, I'd like to, to thank Open Channels and the MPA Center and the EBM Tools Network for, for hosting this. Um, I'm sure you have lots of questions. I, I'm happy to answer those as well as I can. Um, we are at the present somewhere between having a good vision and trying to operationalize this vision and working with um, the Marine Conservation Institute staff, our board of directors, our key advisors, um, scientists, and partners. Um, you can, you can certainly email me, uh, follow on thoughts after this, but we recognize that this, is, you know, the global ocean is a big place. Um, all you have to do is think about this lost airliner that we can't find and recognize um, just how vast it really is. But at the same time, um, current, current efforts, as strong as they are and as good as they are, are not meeting um, the requirements to protect marine life both for the, the benefits to humankind, but also to the world we leave, live in, in terms of you know, healthy climate, healthy oceans, um, fresh food for folks, and that we really need to escalate the effort. And so we're hoping that you will become engaged with us in this effort and um, you know, look forward to your you know, comments and thoughts and, and you know, partnership down the road. So with that, thank you very much again for your attention and, and the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. Okay, thank you very much, Lance.
So I would now encourage anyone who has questions or comments for Lance to go ahead and type those into the question box. And sometimes I need to get people started on this, but obviously this time not the case. There's lots of questions already piling up here. So I'm just, just go ahead and uh, nice to see some familiar faces here. So John Ogden is asking, uh, a functional network needs a governing body, and what do you propose in terms of who will organize or administer this? Uh, so there, there's different um, levels of this for sure, and I think the the top level of organizing the a committee of some sort that would um, be in charge of what Global Ocean Refuge criteria are and who is appointed will be a group of um, probably predominantly NGOs but other participants from different places of the world and that will be the, the committee that will basically uh, confer the awards um, in, some, in something like the way the, um, the Forest Stewardship Council or the Marine Stewardship Council, some of these councils work in terms of multiple partners who have that criteria. The Marine Conservation Institute, you know, sees our role as, as building this up um, and, and keeping kind of the, the vision clean and, and on track, um, but recognize that lots of other groups are going to have to engage. Now, I think maybe what John's also asking is, there should probably be regional nodes inside of that, and, and I think at some point um, many of those um, governance questions are going to have to be more carefully detailed and, and it's beyond what we, we've designed at the moment or thought through. Okay. And there are definitely a couple of questions about how does this relate to other similar initiatives, and a couple of examples that have come up are the Pew Environment Program, and also um, efforts to identify EBSAs, ecologically and biologically significant areas. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Um, so we believe this is the kind of effort that is going to make all of those much more robust. Um, so we're not, we're not trying to um, compete with anybody's effort with regards to what um, they're doing currently. We want to try and encourage those, and we want to encourage those to be um, as effective from a conservation standpoint as possible. So for instance, with, with the Pew effort, you know, if it helps them to say, you know, there are these criteria out there that you need to meet in order to be a global ocean refuge, they can use that in their campaign work, and we would encourage everybody's MPA campaign to think along those same lines. How can they leverage um, third-party criteria to make sure that they get strongly um, protected areas. For, for EPSAs, which is more of a identifying important um, areas, and, and I know there's a lot of discussion as to whether those are MPAs or not MPAs, um, I think we need to look at those as being important input into the types of areas that do need uh, greater protection down the road. Um, some of those clearly um, you know, after a, a designation could be uh, part of a global ocean refuge. Um, we're not, and, and so in case it's not clear, we're not necessarily talking about us, ourselves as specifically going out and designating new areas, though we aren't excluding that. What we're hoping to do is confer a, a standard um, for everyone that will then bring about more um, incentives to groups to try and reach for a higher quality uh, designation and to get more of those in their waters so that they can um, market themselves, I guess is the best term, uh, to others in the MPA space and, and um, people who are, might be in the tourism or travel industry and, and other types of opportunities um, that exist out there. Okay. Here's another comment from John Ogden who, who comments that walling off people from even large ocean areas might work in developed countries but won't work in the open ocean or in developing countries. I would encourage you to think about extending governance to ocean regions through international organizations. MPAs will then be nested within a structure of governance which I think is ex essential to their success. Um, 
I, I think I agree with that. <laughs> um, not not everything has to be um, walled off. That's not what we're talking about at, at all. I do think that areas that limit extractive activities um, are shown to be, you know, much more effective from this, uh, you know, biodiversity perspective and the ability to maintain um, uh, resilience given uh, future threats. But the, the idea isn't necessarily to make everything um, the uppermost level. It's to incentivize people to, to engage in a conversation where they get to a, a minimum standard, and that may be one of the most important and critical steps is what is the minimum threshold for um, being part of the, the ocean refuge. At least it's one of the things that we've identified as being a very important question. And within that, there can absolutely um, you know, I think of a marine protected area like the Channel Islands, which has nested in it um, lots of different uh, types of um, zonations from no take to um, no mostly open access. And I think, you know, that type of strong management could definitely be considered as, as being worthy of, of some tier of a, of a global ocean refuge status. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Aaron Riley who asks, in your research on current MPAs, have you gotten a sense of how many current parks are named within, with no regulations, how many have regulations but no enforcement, and how many poorly designed regulations, and how many are successful? Um, well, the short answer is no. Um, they, they, those are a lot of very um, detail-oriented questions. I think what, um, what we found is a lot of areas don't provide a lot of feedback as to what those areas are. Um, the US MPA Center, um, Australia, there's, there's some countries, Canada, um, that have done very good MPA inventories where that type of information is available. Um, so because I can remember this one um, in, in Canada, and I think this might be British Columbia, um, has about 162 MPAs of which I think one is, is no take. Um, so, you know, we, we have been kind of combing through some of the information like that, but right at the tip of my fingers, um, I don't. One of, one of the real questions that is clear by going through some of um, all the rest of the databases is that there, there still needs to be an awful lot of uh, quality control on the types of records that are out there, and then also relating that um, to other types of uh, research and activities, and I know both our NPA Atlas site and the World Database on Protected Areas and, and probably country level areas as well would love for people to become much more engaged in offering them feedback as to what's in the database. I know they all have these types of feedback opportunities that they're, they're really anxious for, for users to help with. Um, but it, it really is uh, an important aspect of this. Our model right now is um, having people um, potentially come to us um, that are interested in, in having a Global Ocean Refuge designated, and so we would build it rather um, through their participation in the system rather than a lot of outreach. But we do know that from other models, we certainly have to do outreach to areas initially to get um, you know, that first level of, of designation. Um, the first level of MPAs into the system and, and to get it operational. And, and we expect that that will still take um, several years to, to probably get to that point. So related to that, there's a question from Jeffrey Wilgus who asks about what are some of the political challenges that you have encountered when you've been presenting these ideas? Um, I think right now, um, the ideas from the political standpoint are, well, that's interesting. Um, so the, the real challenges are how to get um, some regional um, testing of this um, and thinking through some specific uh, smaller opportunities to engage and show some of the value to this. I mean, we, we can um, talk a lot. I mean, I think everybody knows the, the political challenges um, that exist in the U.S. in terms of, of trying to convince different user groups and different um, people of the value of MPAs. Part of our goal is to make much more explicit the value of MPAs and helping to um, make sure 
people recognize that. Um, but it, you know, political buy-in is is a critically important piece of this, and one of the things that we have to do a lot of of legwork on um, and build you know the models as as we go. I do know um, certain countries are already well engaged in their own um, MPA efforts, and so to the degree that we can help um, those MPA agencies and governments um, provide a more robust, transparent um, setting to their MPAs um, will be a very important step for us to, to take as we uh, engage more of the, the political side of this. Okay. Um, here's a question from Pia Olister, who asks, uh, to what degree have these high conservation value areas already been identified, especially in the developing countries? And if they have, where would be the best place to find these? Um, well, there's, I'm, I'm not entirely sure exactly what the question is. Um, so I think the, it's about the EPSA process is, is yeah. one place that you can get, you know, information on, um, you know, how expert scientists identify these. There's a number of regional um, efforts to identify uh, priorities for conservation. I'm not sure if that's um, part of the question as well, but a number of NGOs have done that as well as some governments in different parts of the world. Um, there, if the question is more about, you know, how many opportunities are there to keep going to high value areas, um, I, I think that's one of the interesting things about taking the more biogeographic approach is that um, you don't necessarily always have to get the highest valued area if you can get biogeographically similar areas um, into the system. I certainly don't want to give up um, unique places, but um, but we are talking more about a biogeographic representative, representative system here. Great. And, and I think uh, I think the question was more about the EPSAs, and for those who don't know the acronym, that's Ecologically and Biologically Significant Areas, uh, identified as part of the Convention on Biological Diversity. So I think if you Google those, you could find a series of regional workshops that have identified a lot of those areas. Yeah, you could certainly go to the GOBI, G-O-B-I.org website, and they would um, link you to papers and reports on that, and they just Great. had a, a recent paper out. Okay, here's a question from Kyle Newman who's asking, what are some strategies for enforcement in remote areas or regions with limited resources for enforcement? <laughs> yeah, so um, we, we did um, at the uh, Marine Conservation Institute a report a while back that, that um, highlighted some of the uh, remote surveillance technologies. Um, and you could, could look through those. There, um, there's still a I think a fairly substantial gap between, um, and sorry, lots of different thoughts going lots of different directions. There, um, there needs to be some real effort put into using the technologies to actually work with managers in a way that gives them the information they need, um, and in ways that you know can be useful to them um, in terms of not just knowing something's going on, but can they make a case against that. So there is a, there are a number of groups working on that. Um, SkyTruth, an NGO that works from satellite-based observations, it's worth um, checking out that organization to look at what might be offered from satellites. Uh, there are also, I know, a number of, of really interesting things in, in the drone world from sail drones to aerial drones to underwater drones that um, have technologies, but how to use those technologies um, in, in a management context is, is still a very new um, idea. The, and then the, I think the last and, and more um, probably, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my thought there. Um, I think it's important that we continue to, um, as we work on these protected areas, think much more about what are the um, what are the fisheries and what are the fishery management um, resources there? Because really, I think MPA enforcement is going to be kind of the, the flip side of fisheries enforcement to a large degree. Um, and so we need to make sure that the MPA managers and fishery managers are, are 
sharing that information. And I don't know that um, that is always the case, but that would be one of the, the first real opportunities to, to bring um, those two together. And I think would be a, a really um, useful start. The, the cost of doing that kind of remote surveillance is going to be fairly enormous for quite a while. Um, and so dovetailing it with other activities that are already underway is, is going to be the main path to having any kind of successful in enforcement or surveillance or monitoring. Okay. Um, here's a question from Allison Pohl, who, who's talking about uh, working with countries nation or globally and wanting to make the point that so often at the local level you have to talk about how efforts are going to affect the economy and how do we connect ecological needs with short-term economic benefits, recognizing that local officials are often elected for short terms? Um, well, there's certainly, um, for uh, the ecosystem services and the quantification of ecosystem services, that piece, um, I think, is, is moving um, probably better than, than most others in this area. And so there have been um, some real efforts to show that if you invest in, you know, coastal protection and, and maintaining, you know, coral reefs and mangroves and wetlands and things like that, that has a real um, economic value. Um, and so that there is, I think, a developing a pretty, well, it, it's partially developed and is continuing to develop pretty well in terms of what the economic value of that is. There's certainly some other interesting um, pieces about the, you know, the economic returns that come from um, uh, fisheries and, and other benefits that go beyond just, um, you know, food in terms of the, the social well-being of some of these communities. Um, and it, it's, it's encouraging the diversity of, of research that is really out there. Um, the National Ocean Economic Project in the uh, U.S. has been trying to synthesize some of that information here, but I, I think, boy, it's a pretty vast area. There's a lot of different people. I would say where it's harder right now is to try and uh, generalize into, uh, you know, the, the bigger scheme things, like can you protect a remote area and, and will that have an economic value to, you know, carbon or, or storage, something like that. Um, I think those are important aspects for future research and in the direction that some of this needs to go because I think that will, um, well, it'll be fascinating to have it looked at, I think, a little bit more carefully. Okay. Um, there's a question about, do you imagine that these MPAs will self-certify for these qualifications or will there be some external body that will do this? Yeah, no, there, there would have to be a third party body or a committee that would do the um, um, the work um, of, of certifying, and then there's a question of, of recertifying or auditing um, that's incorporated in this. I think there, um, you know, the, the models that are out there, there, there's quite a few of them um, that we need to look at and evaluate and, and build um, kind of a strategy at, around as well as look at the economic sustainability of those strategies so that it's robust through time. Um, but, but I think people can, um, an individual MPA would, would need to work with um, this group um, to address how they meet the criteria. And, and even that is costly, I recognize. And so, um, you know, the model will have to incorporate how to help bring those people in initially and then uh, how to expand. And, and as it becomes more robust, then um, show the benefits of being uh, part of the Global Ocean Refuge so that others will be encouraged to join in. So Molly Martin asks a question about um, poorer countries where they don't have the people and the money to perform some of these scientific studies to demonstrate uh, the threats and uh, monitor the MPAs and uh, asking MPAs in developing countries are better than nothing but all benefits are hypothetical and rarely realized and difficult to enforce. So I think one of the questions there is um, how do we help uh, developing countries develop the resources that they're going to need to implement these MPAs? So I, I think um, there are examples of, of very effective MPAs in, in developing countries um, where, you know, the communities have um, uh, 
you know, bought in and, and been in charge. And I think this gets more towards the interaction with things like the um, the turf model, the territorial user right fisheries, and some of the local control of fisheries at the same time. Um, if they have that, then they begin to be more engaged in the idea that they actually need to have um, reserves and protected areas embedded in that, that matrix. So um, I think that's been a very promising direction um, to deal uh, from the ground up at the very local level. Um, but, but I do think that you know, when, when they are engaged in that way and you know, the, the, uh, those programs seem to be doing quite well, um, where they're, they're being implemented, they are bringing external money um, to help them get those set up. Um, from the different you know NGOs and, and other groups that are working on it, and then you know once they've set up the system, they they've been able to do so in a way that that has sustainability to it. Um, it hasn't required um, it's it's gotten community engagement in a way that hasn't required the the really significant um, enforcement um, activities, and you know the, again there are, are different. Um, papers and resources to head in that direction. But I agree that um, the idea of plopping down a big, huge, walled off, no-take reserve in, in the middle of um, coastal areas in developing countries is, is probably not going to be a, a good strategy for anybody's um, MPA. But, but I think that they still can have criteria that help meet um, high conservation value, and that, that meeting those criteria will help them potentially access other um, funds to to help um, their their economy and, and do these MPA management activities that are needed. Yeah, I think several of the questions that have come in, uh, Lance, have to do with the sustainability of MPAs in terms of monitoring and funding, technical assistance, um, and all of those kinds of issues uh, beyond just establishment. Right. So I don't know if you have anything to add <laughs> related to those. We're, we're asking you to solve the problems of MPA. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, I, I, I'm going to have to work on that one a little bit. <laughs> yeah. no, um, I, I mean, we, we definitely recognize that that is one of the big um, issues. Um, I know you can't always say, well, there's going to be an ecotourism benefit, and so you can just, you know, use that revenue stream. Um, there, there have to be other um, potential. Um, streams that, that can be brought to help with, with the longer term um, aspects of this. And, and all I can say is that I, I think we need a yeah, much more um, robust conversation, and that's one of the things we're aware of and need to work on and, and understand that, um, that issue. Well, this conversation is suggesting to me that a future webinar topic on sustainable financing of MPAs would be a good idea. and uh, I do know some groups that are working on that, so that might be a, an interesting topic to take up. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, there's a question here asking from Spencer Reader asking, what's your opinion of which country has implemented the most successful network of highly functioning MPAs? And is it New Zealand? Mm -hmm. I don't know if Spencer's from New Zealand. Uh, no, I don't think it's New Zealand. Um, I, I might have said Australia. <laughs> um, but they, they, there's a little bit of potential backsliding going on. Um, but they certainly, um, you know, I think on the books put forward the best um, ideas about a, 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 you know, a nation, national plan and started moving forward on it. There, there's been several pretty high profile criticisms of it. Um, one of those that you know we've seen recently is you know protecting areas that um, you know maybe aren't the ones that we should be protecting um, is is an issue, but but I still think probably Australia has made the most progress in both in terms of the the scientific thinking and design principles that they've incorporated, and then proceeding down the implementation level, and even with um, you know regrettably some some weakening of it. Um, and, and I guess we'll we'll see where that actually plays out because I think it's still under review. Um, they're probably um, doing the best now. There are other countries, Belize and Micronesia, that are really pushing forward on their own uh, networks and have some plans, but I, I don't think they are near as far along. 
Okay, and one more quick question from Brad Barr asking, um, on the Big Ocean slide, you mentioned, you, you showed the North America, Atlantic, excuse me, the North Atlantic High Seas sites as fully protected. Mm -hmm. and is this a reality or is this a, an aspiration? Um, yeah, no, the OSPR areas are, um, are in place. So um, the Charlie Gibbs and, and those other ones are actual um, in place and they're, okay. Uh, yep, they're and actually there's one last question I'm going to take because I think it's a good closer from Russell Moffat who asks, are there opportunities to help determine ocean refuge criteria or form oversight committees, workshops? Um, so we're, we're engaged in what the process will look like right now. Um, at the moment, we're um, focused more with um, working kind of uh, individually with um, scientists that, have, that are active in the, this field and, and been studying it. We definitely um, want to put forward a, a draft of what the criteria look for like um, later in the year, and if, if people are interested in that, then that would be an opportunity to probably um, participate in some um, comments. We are going to use the International Marine Conservation Congress as an opportunity to uh, do a little vetting and outreach with the group of, of marine scientists that are there. Um, that's what, and you know, we're hoping natural scientists will be part of that um, as well. And then once we we have these. Um, draft criteria that the hope is to actually work with some MPA managers about how well they align with what uh, they're actually doing at their site um, and, and is our uh, hypothetical criteria match up well to um, individual sites. So we would really encourage MPA managers who have an interest in that to um, you know contact contact us as well. Um, so that that's probably you know will take us most of the next year in terms of where we, we get to with that. Um, effort. Okay, well Lance, thank you very much. I think this has been a great discussion, obviously a lot of interest, and I'd like to thank everyone who participated. Uh, and we will have the um, recording of this webinar up on the Open Channels website and the, uh, the PDF up on the MPA Center website. So uh, please feel free to, uh, to check back. And uh, again, thanks a lot, Lance. All right, thank you all.